Hi, Church of Cal. Um, today, we're going to be covering chapter 5. Uh, we've broken up the book of Revelation into a couple different parts, and so we've done this series on the letters to the churches. And now this is session 2, which begins in chapter 4, and we're just calling this section from here to the end of the book, Meta Tauta which, as you know, because we covered it last week, is the Greek words for after these things. So let's jump right in to chapter 5. Once again, where are we? We're in the throne room of God. We're still there. And so last week we talked about the, the diamond, the jasper, the sardius, or the ruby, or the emerald rainbow, and, and 24 elders with white garments and golden crowns casting them before the Lord and the four cherubim full of eyes and wings and the faces of a lion, of a man, of an ox, of an eagle. That was all last week, but we're still in this throne room. And so with all of that as background, let's take a look at chapter five. Let's begin with a word of prayer. As you know, this book is really a book of worship. And so I pray that um, your worship time will be benefited by your time spent in the book of Revelation. As, as we understand the basics and yet understand that God is in control and that he's got a message that he wants to give to this world. And may we, like Isaiah in the past, say, Here I am, Lord, use me, send me, to bring forth this message of great news. So, Lord, we thank you that you're worthy. Lord, words like, we worship you, and, and holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all of these words, may they be more than just words to us. May they be songs that are sung from the innermost part of our being as we seek to worship you. We, we see this picture in heaven of as worship begins, people literally just falling on their faces before you. And likewise, Lord, we worship you. We give you glory and praise and pray now that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see the things that you have for us in your word. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So, back to the throne room. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Again, we're in the throne room. The scroll is in the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And this is a sealed book. It, it suggests that it's a title deed. We get that from Leviticus 25. Listen what it says. In verse 23, it says, if your brother becomes impoverished and sells some of his property, his near redeemer is to come to you and redeem what his brother sold. This reminds us of Boaz. It's the Goel. It it needs to be a kinsman redeemer. This document is the title deed to the planet Earth. Uh, in, in the Roman times, this seal, this document, would have had a, it would have been a last will and testament, seven seals, and it could only be opened by an heir. Again, the concept of a goel, a kinsman redeemer. Now, I want you to remember that when Jesus was tempted 
by Satan in the Judean desert after his baptism. Um, the devil, it says, finally the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. What's noteworthy about this is not Jesus's response, but it's the fact that Jesus did not contest his claim. Because sin entered into the garden through Adam, Satan has the claim. Satan has rule over the planet Earth. Dominion. But not for long. Ultimately, this earth will be redeemed. Jesus began the process when he came the first time and died for our sins, that our sins would be forgiven as the pure what? Not Lion of Judah, but the pure Lamb of God, as John said, who has come to not just cover, but to take away the sins of the world. So this is climatic. This is the ultimate escrow closing. And yet John, and understanding this is looking around and what does it say? No one in heaven, no one on earth or no one on under the earth is able to open the scroll or to look at it. And so verse four, it says, so I convulsed. Your, the words of your translation may say, so I wept much. I was out of control, sobbing because no one, was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And here's one of those great buts, right? Verse five, but one of the elders said to me, one of the 24 elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Who? The lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy. The theme from now on, and the theme, not just from that, the, the total theme of our existence at this point in time, the message is simply this. He did it all. He did it all. He did it all. Jesus did it all all. There's nothing that I can do to earn my salvation. It's a gift, and that gift has to do with the price that Jesus paid that I might be redeemed and restored to him. He did it all. When you grasp that, you're going to understand why worship just breaks out all over heaven because there's only one that is deserving of this worship and praise, right? It's the one who's worthy. The one who can open the scrolls. And again, so back here, we're looking at, at, at John. You know, he's a time traveler, right? He's, he's brought up to at least our time frame. And, and he's looking around him. He's in heaven. He's in the throne room. And so as he hears this elder say, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's prevailed to open the scrolls. As John turns around in verse six, it says, and I looked and woe, or behold. I turned, I look and woe. Behold, in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the four living creature, in the midst of the elder stood what? He thought he would turn to see a lion, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. But as he turns and as he looks, he sees a lamb. There stood a lamb as though it had been slain with seven horns with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God 
sent out into all the earth. And then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Again, in the throne room. When John turns, he doesn't just see a lamb, but he sees a lamb that had all the markings of a sacrifice. The throat slashed. We're told that our Passover lamb, that Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. He was the lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. The lamb that doesn't just cover. It wasn't a sacrificial lamb in the temple that the blood is poured up over to cover sins. No, this lamb once and for all came to take away the sins of the world. You know, I wouldn't be surprised that when we get to heaven, our first glimpse of Jesus is one like this. When we see him face to face, he will no doubt retain, you know, it's been said, what the only man-made things in heaven are what? His wounds. His scars will still remain. And forever they'll proclaim, what? How much he loves me. <clears throat> and so, this depiction of this lamb is not just a lamb that's been slain, but it's one now with power, seven horns. Horns being um, uh, idioms of power, and seven being complete ultimate. He has complete ultimate power. He has seven eyes. He's all present and he's all knowing. This is the Lamb of God that John is seeing in the throne room. Now, verse 8. <coughs> now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, let's, let's take some time here. Let's, let's recap and let's be part of the scene. And so, worship. The 24 elders, what are they going to do? They're going to fall down on their faces to work. Each has a harp. There's going to be songs that are sung in heaven, musical instruments that would be played. But here, I want you to look to see this bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You need to understand and imagine and remember the intimacy of our God. He didn't just love the world. He didn't just love mankind. He loves you. He knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your likes and your dislikes. He has an intimate knowledge of you. Before you were even born, he knew you. And then this bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You know, in Psalm 56, 8, it says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one of them in your book. yours. And so as we open up these bowls, these golden bowls full of incense, each one of our prayers that we've ever prayed, I think the praise that we've ever given him, I think everything is released again. You need to soak all this in because eternity is not just you and a billion trillion people or whatever it may be. It's you and God. The intimacy is there. 
You're not going to just be in the crowd. It's the greatness of God, not the, the mega, not the universe that he's created. It, it's, it's the fact that he knows you by name. I'm reminded back in the letters to the churches where you get a, a stone with a new name written on it that he has selected just for you. And so John obviously is undone. What a scene that's taken place. And I guess you can say you ain't seen nothing yet because in verse nine it says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain, have redeemed us to God by your blood, and out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. This is the gospel. You were, you're worthy. You, you were slain. You redeemed us by your blood. You made us whole so that we're kings and priests. And it's all because of what you have done. You are worthy. And by the way, I have a feeling that even though this is going to be a crowded venue, because the numbers that we're going to read about here in a second are beyond our imagination of angels. But I think that the verses of this song are only sang by you and me and mankind. I don't think the angels sing the verses. I think they sing the chorus, but you're worthy. Why, why wouldn't they sing this? Because Jesus didn't die for the angels, he died for us. And I think that we sing this song because you're worthy to take the scroll because you were slain. You've redeemed us mankind to God by your blood and out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and you've made us kings and priests. Wow. But before we go any further, I just want to tell you that I've been encountering, thinking a lot about the gospel and what our message needs to be in these last days. Not a message of fear, not a message of you better watch it, the wrath of God is coming, by the way, wait till you see what's next, but our message is the gospel. Now, I know you know this, but let me read two things to you. The gospel is what Jesus did for us. It's easy to assume that being saved by faith means that God will now love us because of our depth or because of our repentance or because of our faith. But that is to once again suddenly make ourselves our own savior rather than Jesus. It's not about the amount of your faith, but it's about the object of your faith. That's what saves us. And if we're not careful, the longer that we walk with him, just like the church of Ephesus, that, that their, their first love, they were growing cold. They, they weren't hot. It, it's natural to drift into religion, into man's attempt to make his self right with God. It's easy to drift into religion unless we're constantly challenged and reminded and renewed by the truth of the gospel. It is all about him. It's what he has done. And he is worthy. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. Our, our good works are filthy rags before him. I hope this is coming through for you. 
It's all about him. And this scene in heaven culminates in amazing worship because he alone is worthy because he's done it all. So verse 11 says, and then I looked and I heard the voice of what? Many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000s and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Whew. You know, in the Greek, these numbers of thousands upon thousands uh, it, it, it simply means it's the largest possible conceivable number. So all of you math geeks out there, don't get your calculators out and start trying to figure out how many. It is the largest possible conceivable number that are worshiping, that are singing. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength, honor, and glory and blessing. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord God Almighty. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then, then these four cherubim, these four living creatures, as they're taking in this scene, what do they do? Amen. Amen, 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 amen. And as, like it's a, a cue for us, as these four living creatures shout amen, the four are the 24 elders. I think that's representative of the church, of of mankind, of redeemed mankind. They fell down and they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So, it's kind of what we're looking at, but let's just say, let me say as we prepare for what's coming, Jesus is about ready now to open this scroll and its seals. Now you need to keep in mind what the purpose of the tribulation is. It's not that God wants to just pour out his wrath and punish. I believe the church has been raptured, metatauta, after these things, and now the stopwatch will start. And this is about ready what's going to take place over the next seven years on planet Earth. But what's the purposes of the tribulation? I think to punish nations for their sins, especially for the ways that they've treated Israel. I think that's the sheep goats judgment. I think it's to purge Israel and prepare the believing remnant who will invite him back. And I think is that you wanna keep in mind that the inhabitants that are currently on the earth, they're ignorant of what's taking place up in heaven. What's about ready to take place as the seals begin to be opened? This is God's great wrap up. And so, fasten your seat belts for next week as we begin to take these seals apart and see what's coming. Now, your discussion for today, uh, talk about the gospel. How do you define it? And I want you to pray. I want you to ask the Lord that he'll give you an opportunity this week 
to be part of that process of sowing or reaping for the kingdom of God. Share the message of the gospel. Number two, what tears, what prayers have been bottled up that are in these golden vials? What are yours? Take comfort in the fact that he knows. You know, those the, the idioms that are there where he's uh, eyes and horns, he's all-knowing, he's ever-present, and he's all-powerful. And take some time as, as you begin to share some of your, your prayers. Take time to pray for one another. Take time to, to intercede. And then finally, um, review once again the, the purpose of the Great Tribulation. And then, as I mentioned, fasten your seatbelt because next week it'll begin to unfold. Okay, that's our lesson for today. And uh, whether you go right into worship now or whether you begin to discuss these things, uh, Sharon and I are praying for you all. We, we are so grateful for this relationship that we have with many of you. Some just by the internet, some by this Skype, but many we truly value the relationships that we have with those who have walked with us and worked with us in Israel. And so God bless you all and Shalom.